Hey, it's Jeff Boucher. You're watching Hero Complex, the show. Today, we go back to Starfleet. Leonard Nimoy, this is part two of our interview at his house, the Star Trek icon. Today, he talks about his stage work. Today, he talks about the origin of this. And he also does a William Shatner impression, right? Okay, let's go. As far as, uh, you know, when you look back, uh, feature films, television, and the stage as well. Uh, is there, it's the stage, for instance, that's a very, very different exercise than, than working on a film set or a television set. Um, what, uh, what stage experience do you look back on now uh, with great fondness? Uh, after I finished with the three seasons of Star Trek and two seasons of Mission Impossible, mm -hmm. I began to explore the stage. I had started on stage when I was eight years old, so I was really anxious to get back to it and, and find out where I was with that whole kind of work. And that was in Boston? Uh, yeah, I started in Boston, yeah. And that's the point. I did a, I, I did a, um, a production of Fiddler on the Roof where I played Tevye, yeah. uh, and we played Boston. And it was my first time back on stage in Boston since I had left in 1949. This was in 1971. So my family could come and see me on stage, and I could I could enjoy being at home and being on stage again in a thrilling production. We had a wonderful production. We played north of the city. We played at, uh, down to the Cape, and we had a great, great time. And then after that, I, I did uh, several years of a lot of stage work. Mm -hmm. until, Sherlock Holmes, right? Yeah, I did Sherlock Holmes, and I, I did my one-man show called Vincent, which I toured the country. I did a number of plays. I did The Man in the Glass Booth. I did The Four Poster. I did Caligula. I, did, I, I forget the plays. I mean, I, I really, I had a wonderful time, wonderful time. And I was on stage uh, on Broadway my second time in Equus when I got a call from, again, Jeff Katzenberg called me, introduced himself. He said, I've gone to work for Paramount Pictures, and we'd like to talk to you about acting in the next Star Trek movie. And would you connect a bright line between the release of Star Wars and, and uh, the commercial success there and, and that phone call? I was doing Equus on Broadway in 1977 when I began hearing about this extraordinary success called Star Wars. And uh, on an afternoon off when I was not working, I went down to Times Square and walked in with a theater that was packed, huh. cheering, cheering, screaming, people watching this, this science fiction movie. And I thought, I think I'm going to be getting a call from Paramount pretty soon. <laughs> sure enough, within a few days, they called and said, well, you know, we'd like, we'd like to talk about making a Star Trek movie. They saw the success of Star Wars and, uh, and sort of uh, thought, well, we have one of those. Let's do it. You know, there, you know, be it Sherlock Holmes or your role in Mission Impossible or, or certainly Spock, uh, there's always been a cerebral aura about many of your signature characters and yeah. your signature performances. That's true. That's interesting. Is that is that something that you uh, ever felt restless with? I mean, actors don't like to do particular no, types of no, things. No, I tell you, you know, it's a, uh, you're, you're sort of touching on the issue of, of typecasting. <clears throat> and, and and when I did uh, Spock, people would say to me, are you concerned about what this character is going to do to your career? And uh, my, my my feeling about typecasting is, is that it's a double-edged thing. On the one hand, it can limit the roles that you're being offered. On the other hand, it helps producers and directors to understand how to use you. Mm. It gives them a sense of how you might be useful to them. And I have never needed work, I've never been out of work since Star Trek went on the air, so it's worked well for me. The one major exception was uh, the, a role that I was offered in a, a project called A Woman Called Golda. It mm -hmm. was a, a TV movie about Golda Meir, yeah, sure. and I was asked to play her husband who was not a cerebral character at all. He was a very decent guy, but uh, kind of a guy that made his way through life. And yeah. she was the aggressor, and she moved on in her career and literally left him behind. And I thought, I, I, this is not my, I don't, I don't know how to, this is, this is outside my comfort zone. <laughs> not in my comfort zone. And I kept rejecting it, rejecting it, rejecting it. Uh, the, the producer, Harv Bennett, to his credit, came after me time and time again. <laughs> I said, no, no, I don't get it. I don't know it. I don't know how to do that. And then he said, well, that's too bad because you'd be playing opposite Ingrid Bergman. <laughs> I thought, oh, really? Okay. <laughs> I might be able to figure this out. <laughs> so I took the job. <clears throat> I had a wonderful time doing it. And she, uh, uh, she was brilliant. And, and Judy Davis, I played against Judy Davis and Ingrid Bergman. They were wonderful people. 
And I was nominated for an, for an Emmy, which was very satisfying. I never expected that, and it happened. I was very satisfied. You know. That's great. And he was a key figure on Star Trek as well, Hart. Hart Bennett, definitely. Oh, yeah. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. He was a big help. Yeah. Big help. After the first Star Trek movie, which was not terribly successful as a, as a Star Trek film, it, it wasn't in the, in the territory. He was the one who stepped in and, and took that beached whale and put it back in the water. He did yeah. a great job. And with that first film, I mean, Robert Wise, I mean, one of the, the great names in Hollywood history. Uh, yeah. But the film felt uh, a little turgid, but maybe kind of slow. I think uh, he and Gene Roddenberry were looking for a, a um, space odyssey kind of film, yeah. the kind of thing that Kubrick had done. Sure. Kind of cold, cool, kind of we're out here in space and it's quiet and things move very slowly, you know. <laughs> there was a lot of that and a lot of cerebral stuff. Yeah. They just wanted, was it enough drama? It wasn't a Star Trek movie, really. Yeah. We, it had the Star Trek people, but it didn't use us as Star Trek characters very well. Yeah, it could have been a whole different crew. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. It is interesting, you mentioned before about the, the, the episodes of the series that, that got into ethics or, or uh, social issues or... Yeah. or you know, the sort of the physics of humanity, uh, the fractured physics of humanity. Often. Yeah. Um, was there ever uh, one that you were uncomfortable with or conversely, was there one that you were particularly proud of uh, for those reasons? I don't remember any, any level of discomfort. There may have been, uh, there, may have, there were some scripts that I didn't think were very good, yeah. but uh, not because they were on the wrong side of some political issue or, right. or social issue or moral issue. Uh, the intentions were always good. Some just didn't work very well, yeah. uh, and there were some that worked brilliantly. And there's there's a, a show that a lot of people remember, uh, and and remember well, and remember fondly, that had one particular moment in it that worked, and the rest of it really was kind of repetitive and not terribly well developed. It was the one where the characters, the two central characters, were black and white. One with black oh, yeah. on one side, and one with white on that. Frank Gorshin. That's right. And and I think it was Lou Antonio yes. was the other actor, and they were there was they were opposite. So one was black on the right side, one was black on the left, and it was vivid. And people remember that, and they remember the antagonism between them. And there's a, one great moment where Kirk says, "Well, you people are exactly the same. Why are you at each other?" And the guy says, "Are you crazy? Can't you see? I'm black on the right side. He's black on the left." Exactly. <laughs> That's. Yes. That's the moment in the show. That's it. The rest of it is just kind of, well, you know, we're fighting each other. Yeah. It was one of the great moments is what it was. It's, it, is, it was a, a fantastic moment. And it's interesting to, to see the show and, and some of the things that happened. I mean, who would expect to fight alongside Abraham Lincoln? I mean, how, how, you know, to find yourself on an adventure on another planet with Abraham Lincoln. Now he's fighting vampire. Uh, vampire. That didn't work very well, as I recall. <laughs> it was an interesting attempt that did not really come to life like four score and seven years ago. <laughs> and you've played this character in so many different uh, media, in different medium. Um, I mean, you've uh, feature film, television, uh, animated, right. uh, cartoon, right. video games. Uh, right. that's, that's, he's been with you quite a while. Yeah. A lot, a lot. How do you, how do you, uh, how do you feel about uh, where you left him with the J.J. film, uh, which was great? I feel very, very good about it. Zachary Quinto is a very intelligent and very talented actor. He really is. He's yeah. really, really good. He knows what he's doing, and he knows how to do it, and he he's, has the training to do what, he, what it is that he wants to do. So I'm, I'm very pleased with where the character is. And I had a good time on the last, that last film, um, dropping in there and, and particularly playing a scene with him, which was really interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel good about the character. I feel the character is still very, very useful and, and very interesting, but it's still somewhat enigmatic. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I had pretty much played out any enigma about the character. Pre people pretty much knew who I was and what was going on with me. But Zach has the opportunity to explore some new territory because he, he brings a new, uh, a new condition of his own to the character, and he will. <laughs> the, uh, the familiarity that the audience has with the characters, and as you're saying, you know, the, 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 as the mystique goes away, uh, it's replaced by connection and, right. and, and familiarity. Um, that, that's, that's a difficult balance, too, though, as you move forward because at some point you want to do fresh and new things with the character. Yeah, 
But um, you also don't want to be contrived. Well, I had the opportunity to do that because the character went through some cycles, yeah. <clears throat> uh, death including death and resurrection. You know, that's a pretty good cycle <laughs> right there. <laughs> so I, 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 I was given good writing. I was given yeah. good opportunity to explore the character. Yeah. Um, this has a long history. Uh, it traces back to your childhood uh, in a, a very compelling moment. Uh, do you mind telling we me? We had a beautiful script written by Theodore Sturgeon, wonderful science fiction writer. Uh, the script was called Amok Time, A-M-O-K, Amok Time. And uh, it was lovely. It was poetic. It was exciting. It was dramatic. And it was about Spock having to go home to, the, to his home planet of Vulcan to be married, to fulfill a marriage betrothal. And go home or die was the story. And Kirk had to get Spock to his home planet to save his life. So when we got there, <clears throat> we discovered that the, um, the wedding ceremony is to be performed by a, a character named Tipao, uh, played by Celia Lofsky, a wonderful um, Viennese actress. And uh, she, she's the matriarch of the planet. She's a powerful figure on Vulcan. And I'm to approach her, and I'm, I'm, I'm very sensitized to the idea that this, we're, we're seeing other Vulcans for the first time. Right. We're on the Vulcan planet for the first time. What's Vulcan all about? Right. What, are the, what, are the, what are the mores of the culture? What, what, kind of, what, can, what can I find? What can I show an audience or bring to an audience about the Vulcan people? So as I'm approaching her and we say hello to each other, and she says, welcome home, and I don't remember exactly what I said, uh, what the dialogue was, but I said to the director, I think we need something that Vulcans do when they greet each other because humans have certain kinds of things that we do. We shake hands, we salute each other, we bow to each other in certain cultures. He said, what would you like to do? And that's where I came up with this. Well, and it came from an experience that I had that obviously made a big impression on me because I, it happened when I was about eight or nine years old. I was in a synagogue with my family, my, uh, in an Orthodox synagogue, the men sitting downstairs, the women upstairs in the balcony, you know, with my grandfather, my father, and my brother and myself, comes a point in the service where the, a group of men, I think there must have been five or six of them, is my memory, uh, they are called Kohanim. They are members of the priestly tribe of the Hebrews. Hmm. At this particular moment, they get up in front of the congregation, face the congregation from the stage, what known as the Bema in Hebrew, and they, they chant a particular prayer, which is, translates into, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his countenance to shine upon you. May the Lord turn his graciousness unto you and grant you peace. They, chanted, they were chanting it in Hebrew. Right. And I'm too young to know what it meant. I'm too young to know why they were gesturing, but they were doing this with their hands facing the congregation. And while they were doing that, my dad was saying to me, don't look. <laughs> Well, there's this crazy, fervent chanting going on. They're shouting this prayer in Hebrew, and, and they're shaking and they're rocking. It's, it was kind of a, a, kind of a, a frenzy. And uh, uh, I peeked. I saw what they were doing, and, and uh, I immediately went to work to learn how to do that. Yeah. I had no idea why they were doing it, and much later I found out that this is the, the shape of the letter Shin in the Hebrew yeah. alphabet which is the first letter of the word Shaddai, which is a name for God. Right. So the sense is they're using a, a symbol of God's name as they bless the congregation with that, with that blessing. And you're not supposed to look because I was told many years later that during that benediction, the Shekhinah also starts with a shin, sure. comes into the sanctuary to bless the congregation. And this is the feminine aspect of God. And you don't want to see her because the light that emanates from a deity could hurt you, could blind you, or even worse. So we introduced it that day. The director said, okay, let's do that. Wow. And that's how it got into the show. And it, immediately, immediately on the street, people started doing that. I thought, whoa, we've, we've, touched, <laughs> we've touched something. It's one of those magic things that happens sometimes when you present an idea and a, a big yes comes back. You know? yeah. It's been a big yes ever since. A big yes, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. absolutely. Well, fantastic. Well, what a treat. It's always nice to see you. Yeah, Great to you. talk to you. Having us in your home. Let's do this once a day for, uh, you know. <laughs> well, wait, I have one last question for you. Yeah. At, when we had you at the film festival, you mentioned uh, uh, Shatner. You did Shatner doing The Human Line. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> was there clear of that? It was at the end of Star Trek II. Spock had died saving the ship and the crew. 
and uh, Shatner's doing the eulogy for Spock, and Spock's body is in a black tube that's gonna be shot into space. And Shatner has this speech, and he said, uh, of all the souls I've met in my travels, his was the most human. <laughs> <laughs> You were inside the giant Tic Tac, like, what the heck is going on out there? <laughs> it was very touching, actually. Yeah. It was. Yeah. It was. Well, thanks for all the, the space travels and, and years and years of insight. Live long and prosper. <laughs> you too. Thank you. <laughs>